first presenter is going to be Nadine Dubina from the uh, U.S. Olympic Committee Coach Education Group. And I've had the opportunity to go to a couple of her events in the last year and see what's going on in the rest of youth sports and think outside the box. So um, Nadine, thanks for being here. Come on down. All right, welcome, and thank you guys for letting me be here with you this morning. This is one of my favorite things to do, is come and talk to coaches about coaching. Um, so I'm gonna be a little bit, I move around a lot, so I'm gonna be kind of on both sides of the room. We're gonna be doing some interactive stuff um, as well, because I don't believe in you guys just sitting and being um, listeners. I believe in you being active participants in this. So we're gonna do a couple of things to start off this morning, um, but first, I know you guys are probably sitting next to some people that you know, but you may be sitting next to people that you don't. And so I wanted to start off with an activity that I like to do um, to introduce ourselves in different ways. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put up three quotes, okay? And what I want you to do when I tell you is I want you to choose the quote that somehow resonates with you. It could be about, um, it could be something personal in your coaching. It could be about your team. It could be from years ago. It could be from yesterday. Okay, something that resonates with you with one of these quotes, and you're gonna tell somebody else your name and why that quote matters to you. Does that make sense? So not necessarily where you're coaching, what you're doing, anything like that, but how does this quote resonate with you? And that's how you're gonna say um, your introduction. Okay, so the three quotes. First one, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. Second one, life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you react to it. Third one, great things are not done by impulse, but by a series of small things brought together. Okay. So go ahead and think about that for one second. It's going to get kind of loud, okay? But go ahead and introduce yourself to somebody else and just in a couple of sentences say why that quote matters to you. Okay? Go ahead. <laughs>
something about somebody else that you may not have known if I just told you guys to introduce yourselves by names, okay? So continue to share your stories throughout this next two days because those stories are really powerful and can really help us all learn um, together about each one of our experiences. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you guys one of my favorite quotes. Um, and ex like introduce myself that way. So one of my favorite quotes is, a teacher affects eternity, they can never tell where their influence stops. And this is really um, essentially says why I got into coaching. Um, I had a teacher who was also my um, coach in high school and she basically was the first person that I felt like in my life that actually cared about me as a person. Before I was an athlete, before I was a 10th grader, before I you know, was something else, I truly felt like this coach cared about me and what I was gonna do in my life because of who I was, not because of what I was doing. Okay, and that really kind of set me on this path of how can I create an echo that continues to last throughout time because of that influence that I had. Um, so, a little bit about my background and experience. I first started off my athletic career as a gymnast. I started at five and went all the way up until my senior year of high school. Um, I was a early specialization, one sport athlete. So um, we're gonna go into why that might not be the best thing um, in a little bit, but uh, that's what I did. Um, and similar to some other coaches' experiences, my senior year of high school, I had an injury, one of the first major injuries of my career. I tore my ACL. And so at that point in time, I was like, okay, my body is telling me like, you are done, right? You're done. Um, so I didn't really know what to do. The only thing I'd ever done was sport in school. Um, so because I was rehabbing and things like that, uh, my club gym was awesome and they tried to continue to engage me, which is something that's sometimes not all athletes get, and they said, hey, why don't you come in and coach some of the like kid classes, right? So I started off coaching a couple of kid classes and found out that I don't love coaching kids. Um, <laughs> felt a little bit like babysitting to me. It wasn't really, wasn't really my thing. Um, so I spent a couple of months there and then I said, you know what? I really have this drive. Like I really like working with athletes who want to get better, who want to do things. They're not just being dropped off and then picked up an hour later. So they're like, okay, you can come on and start helping me coach some of the preteen kids and things like that. So that's how I really got started. And at the time, I didn't realize that I was 17, I hadn't graduated from high school yet, and I was already coaching, like I already had a job. I was like, I should probably go to school for this. Like, um, didn't occur to me that I already had a job, I didn't need to go to school for it, but it ended up being good uh, because I went on to West Virginia University, I'm a proud mountaineer, um, for athletic coaching education. Okay, so, and this experience really, really helped shape me. I was a part of the women's gymnastics team, their division one, and I was the team manager. Worked my way into being one of the assistant coaches, student assistant coaches, um, but really gained the trust of the athletes and the coaches and that, and that staff. Thought I wanted to be a college coach until I saw some of the back end politics that are played into that. Um, my assistant coach went behind my head coach's back to get the head coach fired so that he could take over. It was just not a very good place for, um, for me to be at the time. I got to see a lot of the um, toxicity that can sometimes happen in those systems. And I decided that I didn't, I didn't want to be there at that point in my life. So I said, all right, the only thing I know how to do is go to school. So I'm gonna continue going on to school. Um, and I was really, really interested in why some athletes could perform in practice, and then when you put them on the competition floor, they completely bombed, right? And then I didn't understand why some athletes didn't practice at all, practice like crap, and then could turn it on in competitions and just kick everyone else's butt. And I started looking at the mental side and like what really mattered when it came to mental um, training and sport. So I went and got a master's from Fresno State in California um, in sports psychology and studied under a mentor, Dr. Wade Gilbert. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of him, but he is basically the coaching guru in the entire world. Um, an amazing guy, 
anything that you can find on him, he has a book called Coaching Better Every Season, the best resource I can possibly ever say for coaching, Coaching Better Every Season. Amazing book, um, very practical, but he really helped shape me in my understanding of there was no one in this process besides my, besides my academic teachers, which were sitting in a different space than I was coaching in. Um, that could really help me get better. And I kept going, how do I get better as a coach? How do I get better as a coach? And no one was able to tell me besides, go to your conference, learn a new drill. And I was like, that can't just be it. That can't be it because the coach that mattered the most to me didn't necessarily teach me the best drills, right? So, so what can I do? How can I learn how to be a better coach that goes beyond the technical and tactical? Um, I was fortunate enough to get an internship with the Olympic Committee um, in the Coaching Education Department. I've worked my way up there um, and am now the manager of coach development. So my role is to essentially travel the country, see all kinds of coaches like you guys, and work in both big and small group settings um, across all winter, summer, and Paralympic sports um, to help you guys develop as people and as professionals. Okay, so I am here to help you get better because we all need a coach. I believe that never stops. We all need a coach. Okay, um, I'm still in school. I'm still at West Virginia University. I do it online. I'm getting my doctorate. I'm trying to be a bridge between the academics and the and the coaches because uh, we don't always talk the same language. So I don't ever want to be called Doctor Davina. I want to be called Pracademic Davina, practicing <laughs> academic, right? So, um, so yeah, that's me. I also still consider myself an athlete, so I do a little bit of CrossFit here and there. Um, I also have a secret passion for the flying trapeze, um, and so and and I also, like I said, consider myself a coach because I'm here to help you guys get better too. Um, so that's kind of me and my background and story. Sorry, it's a little bit longer than what I had planned, but um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where I come from. So you guys can understand me a little bit better to ask me questions. I'll be here throughout the um, throughout the course until tomorrow. So. All right, so what are we here to discuss? We're gonna discuss four things that are in your control that can apply to um, what sailing's trying to do with some ADM concepts, okay? So we're gonna talk about what ADM is, we're gonna talk about how ADM is impacting Olympic sport as a whole, so you guys can see the big picture, and then we're gonna talk about what you can do as a coach to help impact that bigger picture in your smaller settings. Okay, but we're first gonna start off with an activity because I don't, I want you guys to get up and active. Um, you guys didn't know this today, but Coast Guard came over, said you guys are all under arrest. Okay, we are going to do an activity. There are some um, on this side of the room and on this side of the room. You guys might tell me a little bit. I need you to take this one piece of rope and then pass it down so that everybody has a piece of rope and just hold that for a minute. Don't do anything yet. Yeah, they should be coming down from the left. And if there, you need more, we can get more. I promise this is not a not tying test. Okay, I'm not. Everybody have one? Okay, there's some extras around the room. If you if you need some more, just raise your hand, they'll, they'll get you one. Um, what I need you to do is I need you to create two loops on the ends of both your things. So you can just tie a simple knot on each side so they can move. Okay, just a simple knot. I don't even know what the name of the knot would be, but you guys could probably tell me. <laughs> yeah, sure, that works. You can do a bowling, yeah. Um, I do know, I used to work at a ropes course and I used to do a bowling on a bite. I don't know if that's the same thing, but, but yeah. Um, I know a couple of knots. So you're gonna create your own handcuffs right now. I promise this isn't gonna get weird, okay? I promise. You didn't know you were gonna do this today, but, but you are. All right, so everyone got their two, two loops? All right, Kevin, come on up here. Kevin's gonna be my, um, demonstrator with me. What I need you to do is not until I say go. Okay, so we're watching first. 
practicing your, your skills that you tell your athletes to do, right, all the time. Watch me first, then do. I want you to go, you're gonna go ahead and get a partner, not yet, in a second, get a partner. And what you're gonna do is have a partner put your, their handcuffs on. You're going to simply just create one um, kind of piece over so that it kind of forms a Y or a V. Okay, and then you're gonna put your handcuffs on. Okay, so you're gonna be attached together through just one single loop, okay? Now, the rules of this are that you cannot take the handcuffs off your wrist. You have to pretend like they're handcuffs, okay? They stay on your wrist, okay? You cannot transfer your handcuff to your partner's wrist. They stay on your wrist. You cannot try to make a fire, okay? <laughs> to make this thing come apart, okay? Not gonna work. What you need to do is you need to figure out a way to manipulate the ropes using your endpoints so that you can eventually get yourself. Yep. Don't do that. <laughs> okay. So your goal is to end up like this, free from your partner, without taking those handcuffs off your wrist. You guys ready? If you've done this before, play along, okay? <laughs> between 2008 and 2013, so almost 10 years ago, um, between five, 10 years ago, that showed a drastic decline in youth sports. So we saw things from a small decline in basketball and soccer to the two most um, participated sports in the US um, for, for youths, 
and we saw them dropping all the way down to 30% drops in, in sports in general. Okay, in those five years, 2.6 million kids left sport. And not just left one sport to go play another, left sport to <coughs> never play again. Okay, so why does this matter? Okay, great, like we don't, we don't work it, all of us work in that space. If we don't have a pool of athletes, we don't have Olympians. We don't have college athletes. They come from kids, okay? What's even crazier now, this is just updated in 2018, okay, is that the conversation's moving bigger than just sport, right? Like, yes, we want kids to be active and playing in sport, but we've now got only 23, almost 24% of kids up to 12 years old who get three days of high intensity activity a week. Just three. Only 24% of kids get three days of, acti of high intensity activity a week. And we, we can see this, right? There's a growing trend in obesity. Um, there's a growing trend in sitting and not going outside and playing. There's a bunch of different factors for it. It's not, that's not really the reason behind this, but it's the fact that there are a ton of athletes out there in kids that are being driven out of sport because of the exclusivity. And 25% of athletes said that they were driven out of sport because of their coaches. So a quarter of those 2.6 million athletes left sport because of us sitting in this room. And not, not us specifically, but because of bad coaching, right? Right? Our profession, they left because of our profession, what we come to work every day to do. They left because of that, okay? So, if this doesn't, if this doesn't get you, okay, here's another video on trying to pull at your heartstrings here, okay? So, what does this look like? What does the future look like for our kids? <coughs> I probably would make a time machine. I would make medicine for the sick. I'd probably invent something new. Well, why you know? That's all I can get. I could have an extra five years to live. You said five, right? Five years. It's a long time. I don't really try to fix everything I did bad. I would bring my uncle back because I miss him very much. I would um, get a, more hamsters. I would probably want to go looking for dark matter. I think I'd go looking for aliens. If I could live an extra five years. I was thinking about making like a, a helicopter. Like a wooden helicopter. But I don't have any wood. <laughs> I don't know if I'm I'd probably teach my sister not to hit tuna. I would try and invent a machine that lets you that lets you learn at light speed. If I have five more extra years to live, I would be the boss of all the chipmunks. If I did nothing to do millions of pistols, I don't really know. I think I'd do anything. Why are you asking me that? <laughs> That's massive, right? We love our kids. And they are now being predicted to not outlive us. The first time in history that our kids aren't going to outlive their parents, right? And we have the potential to impact that as coaches, okay? So, we're gonna bring the mood back up, right? There's good things that can come out of this, so we're not gonna stay down. We're gonna be motivated, I promise. We're not gonna feel handcuffed. Um, the reason why we put together the American Development Month, I'm gonna give you, give you what exactly it is, is that we put this together for all of us, okay? It is a plan from the beginning of your life to the end of your life. This includes kids at young ages. 
This includes excellence and high performance. And this includes all of us as we leave kind of those prime years and what we do being active for the rest of our life. Okay, this is about everybody. So our formal um, kind of thing that we did in 2014, the US Olympic Committee along with, we piloted it with several NGBs and then other ones have come on throughout the years, um, is that we created the American Development Model to help Americans realize their full athletic potential and utilize sport as a path towards an active and healthy lifestyle. I have three words in here that I think are really, really important. Anybody he predicts what those, what my three most important words in here might be? Active healthy. Active healthy. Yeah, what else? Full athletic potential. Athletic potential, yep. Lifestyle. Lifestyle, yep. Yeah. Path. Path, yep. Yeah. So my three words were Americans, that's all of us. It doesn't just include, like this is the United States, right? All of us here. Doesn't exclude anybody. Potential, right? Because everybody has potential in them. It just depends, depends on how we can help them get there. And then lifestyle. <coughs> is that this isn't something that you just do every once in a while. This is something that we can bring into all of our families' lifestyles that we, that we have the power to touch. All right. So... ADM, five stages. We're not going to get super crazy into this. You guys have your own five stages, and it basically is the pathway that supports healthy sport throughout life in all different realms, so physical, mental, psychosocial, all of those. And it's based on some Canadian work. Okay, we're not going. We're not going to go into the Canadians because we don't really like them that much. But basically, just know <laughs> we love the we love the Canadians that are with us. <laughs> We don't love the Canadians who beat us. Okay, um, they're one of they're one of our one of our rivals, right? Um, but there has been a ton of research on this thing called long-term athlete development. Okay, so across the whole years, Canada has their own system for it. Canada has their own implementation for it. Basically, what we decided to do was we decided to take all their research and do what we do best: borrow the best ideas put some red, white, and blue on it, and make it, make it Americanized, right? Like, we, we like things our way. We couldn't say, let's do Canada's system, because it wouldn't work, first of all. And second of all, we like things red, white, and blue, okay? So, we took this, and we basically created a framework, okay? So our framework, different than, than the original research, which is very prescriptive for each sport, we basically said, here's the best principles. These apply across all sports, your job as, as coaches and as uh, national governing bodies is to take the best principles and figure out how this would actually work in your practice, right? So difference between principles and practice. Um, and our outcomes touch everything, right? Our first one, the United States Olympic Committee, it's not really to grow youth sport. Ours is to win medals, right? Like this is to help us win medals. We want to be successful. But we know that in order to do that, we have to look at who's up and coming. We have to go back to the starting pole and really make sure that they're developing along the line. Otherwise, we don't get Olympians. We don't get college athletes. We don't get national team members. Okay, so it is about elite athletes. Okay, but it's also about fundamental skills that transfer between sports. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that later, about how we can develop athletes who may not stay in your sport, but that can potentially go on and achieve greater things in other sports due to you and your work. Um, we also talk about just individual athletes. Just because an athlete, not, every, not all of us can make the college team, not all of us can make the national team, but we can all get better and learn life skills through sport if they're taught correctly. And then we can all be athletes for the rest of our lives. Okay, I, don't, I believe that the definition of athlete can change, but I believe everybody in this room can still be an athlete. It's just in a different context, in a different way. Okay, so how can you continue to be active throughout your whole life? All right, so I want you to turn to a partner. And right now, before we get into some more on how sailing does this, how some different NGBs do this, I want you to not think about what's wrong right now currently. Okay, I know I presented a little bit of that. I want you to instead flip the question and ask what is right 
with U.S. sailing right now, okay? We tend to grow in the direction of our strengths, right? We don't always grow the best in the direction of our weaknesses. So don't look at what's not there. What are you guys doing right in U.S. sailing right now or in your clubs? It doesn't have to be the big grand scheme. What are you doing right? Go ahead and turn to a partner and just say a couple of things. <laughs> and how we do things because that's really where this changes okay it doesn't we're gonna get to behaviors later but behaviors can't change until you look at what you think and what you say right that comes before behavior change we always go to behavior change first right like we always go to eat a different food but if I don't believe that I can lose weight it's not gonna matter okay so what's right focus on that focus on what you're thinking and saying about the good things about about what you do all right, so what, what can we say about, about this, new, this new concept? Well, when we first started off, this was really, really unclear and confusing. You guys in the room might be unclear and confused about what, what sailing's trying to do, okay? But what we're gonna do is we're gonna look through a couple of different sports. We're gonna look at the first one that really took hold of this, um, USA Hockey. Talk about them a little bit. Talk about how other sports have adopted this and how they're using it. Um, so that we can bring a little bit more context into this is bigger than just us in the room. This is the, this is the US, this is about Team USA, not about just USA Sailing or US Sailing. Okay, so back in 2013, hockey had huge dropout rates. Okay, they could not get athletes to sign up for their eight and under teams, and then they couldn't retain them each year. Okay, so they basically went off of the, um, the Canadian model, the Canadian uh, long-term athlete development model, created their own model and said, we're gonna try this because things aren't working, okay? And they decided to make sure that in their model, they emphasized five points, okay? And these areas are all interrelated. So they did technical, tactical, mental, physical, and psychosocial, okay? It's not just about the technical, tactical. Okay, it's about how do we develop athletes across all these realms that are important. Okay, now, you're gonna see some of these things and you're gonna think that it looks like a really clear path, right? Like we had some nice building blocks. You're gonna see some of these other models on paper. This looks real easy peasy. This looks real nice. Climb the ladder and you're good to go. This is actually what it looks like. Okay, right here. <laughs> It's not, athlete development, as you guys know, is not a simple forward one step process. Okay, athletes develop at all different rates and at all different times. One of the um, driving forces behind USA Hockey was that they went over to some other countries and had some of like the Finland, Norway, some of the big hockey country, their, their head coaches come over and just watch some of the hockey practices. And it was during a selection camp and one of the um, U.S. coaches afterwards had, let's say, 200 athletes in there, said, these 12-year-olds, these 20 are going to make the Olympic team. Put money on it. These 20 are going to make the Olympic team. The rest can go home. 
We don't need to worry about them. Don't fast track them. Don't put them in any extra programs. They can go back and just work in their clubs, but these 20, put all your money into them. And one of the other coaches from Finland or Norway, one of the other um, blocks they went, what are you talking about? How do you know that these 12 girls are gonna be on the team? They're the biggest, fastest, strongest. What do you mean? They're the best. They're beating everybody else. They're kicking the snot out of these other kids. And he went, but they're 12. They haven't even reached their full physical height maturity. Like what if they stop growing? And what if this kid grows like a beanstalk? You know, what if this athlete just happens to have more weight on him right now? What if he is, his mom is a teacher and he can speak better so you are he's perceived as being older, right? And he's not, you can't weed out kids at 12. You can't predict, we cannot predict who's gonna be on the team at 12. Okay, it doesn't work that way because there's so many factors because this is happening at all times, right? We have to figure out how to muddle through that kind of period between when they're growing and developing. And this happens until the 20s, right? The brain isn't even fully developed until our late 20s. Okay, this continues to happen throughout the lifetime of how do we look at each athlete's potential and not weed them out early, but help bring them up through the system. So they ask themselves the hard question. Are we developing athletes or are we developing many adult players? Right? They were trying to develop many adults at 12 instead of letting them be athletes, which is what's important. Okay? So they said to themselves, we have to capitalize on what is known as the optimal window of skill acquisition, the age that a kid can maximize his genetic potential, whatever that might be. In hockey, skill acquisition, optimal trainability is through 12 years old. So we had to ask ourselves for two years, are we creating an environment where the focus is on hitting and not on making plays, right? So they couldn't keep kids in from eight until 12 because they were playing an adult game. They weren't playing to help athletes develop the skills so that they could, when they became adults, play that game. So their starting point was physical literacy. Does anybody know the term physical literacy? Can anybody tell me what that is? Yeah, John. <laughs> um, it means running, jumping, throwing, rolling, all yeah. those skills. Exactly, so basically we think about being literate means you can read, right, you know, your ABCs, your one, two, threes, um, all that stuff. We know about literacy in school. Right, but there's also literacy when it comes to physical movement. Okay, and our job starting out is not to only make sure that athletes know how to do our sport well, but it's that they know how to actually move their bodies so they can continue to move throughout um, their life. So you have to make them confident in order to move, you have to make them confident, and you have to make them motivated. Right, this is kind of where that argument on like punishment with physical activity kind of comes into play here. Don't demotivate through consequences for physical activity. Um, but this is really important. I will say my first year coaching CrossFit, I, I coached before this, but my first year coaching CrossFit, I had an adult who was 28 years old. I, I didn't even know what to do. It like completely stopped me in my tracks. He couldn't not only jump a jump rope, he couldn't jump off of two feet and land on two feet. Not joking. Didn't have the coordination to actually jump. Completely fine, there was, no, there was nothing wrong with his, with his system, but we went to jump rope one day and he couldn't jump rope. So I just brought out like a 25 pound plate and said, okay, instead of doing that, jump up onto the plate, jump off the plate. Couldn't jump up and off of a raised surface this high. Right, so there are, and I was just like, what is happening right now? What is happening? How did you make it through your life, you know? Um, but this is what's happening, is that they're not being taught how to move. I'm a great example of this, because while I was taught how to move my body super, super, super well, people think I'm a phenomenal athlete, right? I, if you were to kick a soccer ball at me right now, I couldn't kick it back to you, I mean I could, but like, if it was going at a high speed, 
I couldn't actually take my foot back, perceive where a ball is going, and be able to kick it. Because I didn't learn in that optimal training window hand-eye and hand-foot coordination. Everything that I did was my body around a single moving object. I moved my body around it. That works really well for some things. I cannot play in an adult softball league. Okay, it limits my capacity. Adult kickball, it's really popular in Colorado. I don't know if it is where you are. I can't play adult kickball. Like, these are the fun things that you go to do in your life. I can't do them, okay? So, it's not just people who don't play sports. It's also if they've only done one sport and never experienced others, okay? So, we have to make sure that we are teaching kids how to move in every single area, okay? That includes on the water just like what you guys are doing, which a lot of the times gets, um, gets left out sometimes. All right, so they decided to start there, teaching small games, teaching physical literacy for those younger ones so they could create athletes up the movement. Um, one of the big things with hockey, which I'm sure you guys have some issues with uh, finances, right, around how expensive it might be to do your sport. It's really expensive to do ice time, to rent ice. One team was running ice, paying a lot of money, creating a barrier for teams to get in because the parents had to pay a lot of money in order to rent the ice out. So they decided to go to a small sided games. We're able to get three to four teams on the same ice at the same time and basically created it so that over here, they may have a small sided game on. Over here, they have another small sided game on. And in the middle, they split it up to do drills. So they go ahead and um, they configure their practices so that all athletes are moving at all times. They're playing the game small time so they can get a lot more, lot more puck, uh, puck touches. And then they're working on specific skills in the middle. And they're just rotating through and rotating through and there's multiple teams at one time being able to do this. Brought the cost down because now three teams are sharing one hour of ice instead of one team. Okay, kids actually enjoyed it because they were actually getting to play. Right? They were learning things. They were having fun with their friends. They weren't just waiting for the one big kid, the one fast kid, to take the puck all the way to the end and then score. Okay? So lifting some of those barriers. Um, so how has it worked out for USA Hockey? It's worked out really, really, really well. So they showed in 2016 and 17 here, they steadily grew over five years, and then they exponentially grew. They had a record number of first year incoming and a record number of returning. What do you think this big number of eight and unders, not only coming into the sport, but staying in the sport means for you guys at your level? It's a lot, a lot of money, okay? And people being in your sport, the youth typically are the ones who fund your higher teams, right, through their membership fees. You get kids in, you get kids to stay. They now make millions of dollars off just their young teams. And they're actually getting a good product. Like, athletes are now getting a good product for being there. Okay, so there is potential at both sides of this to help raise some of those barriers off and help kids continue through the system. We now have almost, what, there's almost 12,000 more athletes now who are in that system that they can choose from going down the line. So what does this look like with some other sports? I'm just gonna give you kind of the highlights of how they've used them. Again, it's a framework, so each one does it a bit differently. Ski and snowboard, basically for some of their disciplines, they're, they're um, got a lot of disciplines, they're a little bit different, but alpine skiing, they took this and said, this is what you have to do to get onto the national team onto the national team. At each stage, this is where you need to be. Okay, so theirs wasn't as much of a um, practice planning. It was, here are your requirements to get onto the team. This is what it looks like throughout your whole year. USTA did awesome stuff as far as up here. They actually went and changed some of the equipment that they use. Okay, so they got different balls that had different weights and had different bounceability. I don't really know what the actual term of that is, but um, for the younger kids, the balls don't quite bounce as high so they don't get out. They stay lower to the ground and they move slower so they can actually get to the tennis ball. They also do small sided games and this is for all of their competitions. Okay, so every USTA match, 
depending on their age group, has to play on a smaller court and with these specific, specific balls, okay? So that's what they did. USA Track and Field said, you know what? At the younger age, we don't really want them to be doing high comp competitions, things like that. What we wanna do is we just wanna get that physical literacy component. So they partnered with Hershey and said, how can we create more kids to move? And so they just have a run, jump, throw program, six weeks long, and they basically teach kids how to run, jump, and throw. Exposes them to their sport so that later when it's in their school systems, they can go ahead and they know that they can, they can be a part of that team. Having fun while I do it. USA Baseball is a little bit more, they went the, uh, the, wordy, the wordy way um, and broke things out in each different stage and said what each different thing is. So they broke out into their specialization, their psychosocial well-being, their injury prevention, physical development, what that means for each different component in each different level. USA Wrestling did a great thing where they started off by saying, what does this mean for coaches? Here's our recommendations. Great, we have this awesome model, but what does it mean for coaches? What does it mean for parents? We're gonna, show, we're gonna go into parents in a little bit too. Basketball is one of the biggest um, sport participating for, for kids and they decided to not really go the ADM route as far as language goes because um, it would just be too hard to communicate that to the masses. So instead, they went to the participation guidelines. They hired a team and they basically said that they now have, for every age group, how long games should be played, how many times per week they should play them, practice length, number of time, number of practices per week. And the most important thing that they did is up here, they put in some rest guidelines. Okay, they said that in order for athletes to get better, they have to actually have time to recover. They can't go from sport to sport to sport or go from AAU team to high school team to club team to travel team to this to that and never have any time off. We get burnt out as adults. We have to let our kids also re recoup so that they don't get injured. Lacrosse did something very similar to you guys as far as, yeah. Question. Yeah. What you just said about athletes burning out, what if the kid is a kid who just loves to play different sports and wants to do it? Um, how do you, I mean, do you just tell them no or are you trying to make up excuses as No, so it's not, it's not taking off entire seasons. It's making sure, like they can play different sports, that act, that's actually right. really, really great for them. But it's, weekend, yep. No, you just want to make sure that there are specific days. It could be one day a week that you're not playing organized sport, right? It could be that you take a vacation for a week. They could still be active. Kids are allowed to be active. But it's more from the organized sport of the repetition of certain movements, right? You can do all movements. That's fine. Um, but it's more on those guidelines of not doing repetition over repetition every single day of the week, um, things like that. So yeah, um, lacrosse decided to square their pyramid. Your, your guys' this looks very similar to this. Um, but the cool thing with them is that they have a ton of free resources. They came out with something called 60 Ways to Play. If you just Google that, it comes up. And this is all on physical literacy games. So if you don't have any ideas on how to do the run, jump, move, all that type of stuff, go there. They gave 60 different ways to incorporate that into your warm-ups. Just incorporate it into your warm-ups, five minutes, into your warm-ups for the day. Teach kids how to move. Um, they, they did something even more. They took the coaching um, handbooks and said, you know what, we need better coaches in here to teach to this. So they created handbooks for each different level and put different practice plans in there, put different focuses. Basically, I've never coached lacrosse. I could go using this handbook and teach lacrosse to eight-year-olds for a six-week period. Walks me through it, okay? They also... Um, use um, our mobile coach system really, really well. So they said, okay, yeah, books are great, except you can't bring a book out onto the, the playing field. You can't bring a book out there. But they put everything onto a mobile app. So you can now pull everything up there. So you guys have different resources to you, even if it's not in your sport right now. Things may be coming in the future for that, um, for you guys. But there's different resources out there that we can, we can incorporate. It doesn't just have to be your sport. Volleyball great way that they did it was they did theirs in experience years, not in 
age years. Yeah, school years, right? So just because you're 15 doesn't mean you get put on this team if you're in just the first year. Okay, this is where you start if you're in the first year. Okay, so having that based on experience instead of their, their age in school. Football created a game between, uh, between a flag football to full-on tackle. They call it rookie tackle. Instead of 11-player teams, they have seven-player teams play on smaller fields. So they can have two games going on at once. Um, all players rotate through the positions. So they actually learn the game before they actually get to that one position that they're going to play in. So they did that. And then, here's your guys'. Have you guys seen this yet? No? Some of you? Good? Yes? Um, John's in charge of see if you have questions on it, ask him, but, but basically went to a squared model of inclusivity instead of exclusivity, of, of getting people out, okay? So this is a system. They've come up with different stages of learning and development. You guys are in the beginning of this and that's okay, right? Everybody started right here, right? So we now have different things that we can um, say whenever, whenever those, whenever, People, other coaches come up to you and go, this would never work. It does work. It's working across 25 of our different NGVs right now. Okay, it's making athletes better if you buy in, right? So it goes back to what you think and you feel first. Now you have some different examples of different things you can say about it. Go ahead and take some time to actually look through the resources that USA Sailing's bringing out. Okay, and they're in the stages of trying to roll this out now. They've piloted it over the past um, year or two, so they are now looking to roll this out on a, on a bigger scale. Okay, so what can you say about um, U.S. Sailing's 8 a.m. as it comes out? Okay, all right. This is um, just a little bit of, of hockey's kind of promo here. Everything that your athletes are doing is sport. It doesn't just always have to be yours whenever they're that young. It actually makes them better in the long run. 80% of our Olympians on Team USA, 80% were multi-sport athletes until college. So whenever you get the Tiger Woods examples, the Serena Williams examples, those are the outliers. Okay, They're the ones who did one sport for their entire life the majority of athletes who make the Olympic team are multi-sport athletes. It will not make them worse, it will make them better for you when they come back, okay? Give them some of that time. All right, so let's get to the doing part. What does this actually look like? Well, we had some skepticism ourselves when we first came up with this, so we said, let's try this thing. So uh, my boss, Chris Snyder, is the, uh, he coaches lacrosse at a, at a high school in Pennsylvania at the time that, that we both were in that area. So we uh, went out to one of the high school, high school clubs and said, hey, can we try ADM with you? Can we try to build this? What does this look like? Can we do this with the high school team? Okay, so this is the high school team we worked with. And we essentially put together the five stages for our club. You guys can take the recommendations that USA Sailing is giving you and create this for your clubs, create this for your teams. What does that look like? What are the recommendations for each different level? Because if you are at a higher level or a lower level and you don't know what's going on throughout that pathway, then you essentially aren't helping the next people, you aren't helping that athlete get to the next stage. 
okay? So figure that out. We broke this out even farther. We said, okay, in for kindergartners through two. Okay, let me, La Crosse in Pennsylvania, they're crazy, okay? They're just crazy. <laughs> they get, like, before you can have a kid walking, they've got a lacrosse stick, okay? So, so they um, start at kindergarten, and we start to break this out, okay? They're going to do it anyways. They're putting their kids in programs in kindergarten anyways. So let's go ahead and figure out what that looks like. That looks like having kids just having fun, going out there, free play. Let them just get some sticks and some, some balls and just throw it around. Learn some throwing, learn some catching. Have some hula hoops out there. Have some soccer balls. Doesn't really matter, just get them out there learning, okay? And then we went through the whole system, all the way up to high performance. What does that look like for our varsity teams? What does that look like for our JV teams? How are we going to bring in the mental and leadership side of things? It's not just about the technical and tactical. We had, um, we standardized for all of our teams to be, they had 10 to 15 minutes of physical literacy per practice, even in high school. Okay, so that was in the warm-ups or the cool-downs. Played ultimate frisbee. Kids love ultimate frisbee, right? It's super fun. Um, we also did some mental training with them. So just bringing in little concepts that, that you guys can, can bring into your team to train them mentally as well. And we also brought in some evaluations, some coach training. Did all this, and we don't know what the entire result is yet because we did a, tw a four year plan, 2017 through 2020. Um, but they are retaining 97% of their club right now. Okay, 97% of their system is coming back every year, which is honestly amazing because every year you're going to lose some just from kids moving and injuries and things like that. Okay, so, um, so yeah, they're retaining that. They're, they look like they're going to hit that goal. Um, one of the things that we did for this that was really cool is we did some reflection cards. So do you know, do you keep track of what you're doing every day, every practice? Maybe not every day, every week. What are you trying? Are you marking that down? Are you using pointed questions to help you get better? What does that look like? Are you measuring the things that matter? This is simple. Put it on a three by five card. Put down what you want to track. Just do it after every practice. You've got, you've got three minutes. Okay, did we hit these goals? Yes. What did I notice this week that I need to, in this game that I have to, or this competition that we have to work on next week? Write it down. At the end of the season, you can actually go back and see the progress or where you might need to work on in the off season, what you might need to do for your athletes moving forward. What do they need from you to be better? Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, you guys will have the, um, the uh, PowerPoint of this too. But um, basically, in practice reflections, I say, what was the most valuable part of the practice for the team today? What did you notice from the practice that should be focused on next? Right? So not just what did we, what did we do today that was good, but what should we focus on tomorrow that will help us? Um, coaching reflections, what could you have done better to prepare for today's session? Coaching isn't just showing up. Right, that's part of it, but there's some stuff that goes in the before and after too. What does your team need from you to continue to improve this week? What can you do to get better? Don't forget yourself in the equation of this. You're a part of the team. You expect your athletes to get better. Have that same expectation for yourself as well. Um, let's talk about the parents a little bit. What can we do about parents? Let's see if you guys have seen uh, this this video. Two other new faces here. Who wants to go first? I bet the farm of my son playing in the NBA. Literally, I took out a second mortgage on the family farm to pay for basketball camps. Our Daniel could have played in the NHL. What is Daniel doing now? David doesn't like to speak about it. My son is an astronaut. Daddy tells me that she doesn't want to play soccer anymore. After all the years I put him. How old is Bailey now? Going on seven. Why? <laughs> There's actually like a minute, like there's a long extended version of that. It's hilarious if you if you look it up. Just it's yeah, it's so so funny. But what are we doing with our parents, right? It is so my favorite time in sport was being a judge of gymnastics because I didn't have any parents. <laughs> the parents went to their coaches, not to me. Okay? So parents can be really overbearing until I learned 
how to actually start engaging them in the process. Sometimes they're too engaged and you have to talk about how to properly engage and have boundaries, right? But a lot of the times it's just easier for us to go, I'm not gonna deal with it, right? They're over there, I'm doing my job. But we have to engage them in order to disengage them. You guys have to be the ones who go and say the things that are true. Give them the evidence that, that doing soccer from the time you're five to seven, 24 seven with your athletes isn't going to make them better. It's going to make them not want to be in sport anymore. It's going to make them drop out, right? Kids shouldn't be coming to you and saying they do, they, they're here because their parents are making them be here, right? We have a lot of, a lot of parents, sometimes I feel at least, that are living their lives through their kids, right? Sometimes we just talk about some of those, those boundaries and engage them in what this means for all of us moving forward. Right? What is the best thing for that athlete? And they're trying to do, all parents are trying to do the right thing. Right? They're not coming from bad places. They just sometimes don't have the knowledge and skills that you do to help um, put them in the correct pathway for, for their athletes. All right, so this is one of my biggest things with this, is that we have to forget about the big changes. Right? Like we presented on a lot of this. There's going to be a lot that comes at you in the next couple of years whenever this comes down the pipeline. It's not about the big change. It's about the one tiny thing that you can do every day to create different habits, right? It's about the big things that have small beginnings because where excellence happens, it's in our repeated habits every single day. And we tell this to our athletes all the time. It's what you do today that will build on for tomorrow. What can you guys start doing today? It's not doing the whole model Okay, it is simply just taking one thing. Maybe it's that today you think about this maybe with a positive light instead of a this will never work, right? It starts there, it starts with your thoughts. It then might start to, you know what? All right, we're gonna do, we'll do some agility drills in our warm up today, get them warmed up. Starts with an agility drill. It starts with maybe going, you know what? Today in practice, we're going to do some team building. We're going to figure out how you guys work together instead of being on the water and maybe transfer it there. Right? It's just little tiny things that you do every day that will start to compact and build the movement. Okay? I'm going to give these guys to you for later, but these are kind of the best coaching principles that we have behind ADM. Um, but you guys can read these, read these a little bit later. We've gone through a lot of these um, through, this, through this session. Um, but remember that... We never know who will become a butterfly. There's nothing in a caterpillar that will tell you it's going to become a butterfly. Nothing. Okay? But our athletes are all caterpillars. Okay? We have to develop them into butterflies. Get one opportunity in life. One. You learn to grasp. So you live and you train and you fight for that moment. And when you get that moment, you shine. And you show the world, and you show yourself how special you are. Has anybody seen um, any of our next Olympic hopeful videos? Does anybody know what the next Olympic hopeful is? No? So we've made, it, we've made it one of our goals to try to pull from all of our sports to figure out which athletes are the best all across the board. Okay, so there's, um, I believe it was just this weekend, we're in our second season of it, but basically what we did was it's talent transfer. How do we transfer one athlete from here who might not make it to a national team level, but they would be really good at rowing? or rugby, or weightlifting, or bobsled, or anything like this. A lot of the times, we have found that you guys in this room are training athletes for other sports, right? Is that our entire bobsled team, USA bobsled team, entire team is made up of transfer athletes, okay? Not one of them starts bobsled before they're in college. I can't say not one of them, maybe one or two. But very, very, very few, okay? Not before they're 18, right? So, so they're, yeah. Um, so 
Look at your athletes and where they can go with this. It's not always just where you can, where you can take them here, but where can they go and be the best that they can be. We're training Team USA here. All right, so I'm gonna ask you guys to take a leap of faith, okay? There is a lot behind this. We know that it works. We know that it's gonna make us better. It's gonna start with small, tiny castles, okay? We're slowly gonna build momentum. Those castles are gonna look a little bit better and a little bit better until you guys build an empire, right? But it starts with you. It starts with those changes. It starts with what, whoops, sorry. It starts with what you think, feel, say, and do. Okay, you're not handcuffed here. We're unlocking you to be free. All right, last, last little thing and then, and then I'm off. Um, I love this video. They told me it couldn't be done, but I was a lost call. I was a dog and big black. Coach did it all the time. You guys can all do this. We all have faith in you. Thank you guys.